uh, some pinch hitters and all of that. So uh, we do appreciate uh, everybody cooperating and making it the success it's been. I feel like that if it had not been for the weather, we would have had much larger crowds. In fact, I just know that we would because I've had any number to call me uh, saying that they had planned to be here, but because of the weather, they, they had to cancel their plans. And I'm very regretful, but that's something over which we have no control at all. But we are glad for your presence. We're happy that you're here. We have a young man named Broderick Greer. I believe you go over to the Hanley, Hanley Congregation. <clears throat> Broderick's going to lead us in number 642. So if you would, please turn to that number. And after he leads us in that song, Brother Robert Moss, who preaches over at the uh, Highlands Congregation, is going to lead our minds together in prayer. Then following the song and the prayer, I'll have a few things to say by way of introduction to the panel. panel the panel will take over from there, and we want you to be thinking of some good questions to ask the panel. Uh, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So that's the general theme. And so you be thinking of a question that pertains to human life on the problems that arise in our lives because I'd love to see the panel be stumped a little bit, make them scratch their heads and think. But uh, nonetheless, we're, we're looking forward to this. So let's sing together number 642. <clears throat> Number 642, the Lord's my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness within the paths of righteousness in for his own name sake yea though i walk in death's dark veil yet will i fear not ill for thou art with me and thy rod. For thou art with me and thy rod. For and me comfort still. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house forevermore and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. Let us pray. 
us pray. Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we pause before your throne at this time, Father, in humbleness and thankfulness, Father, for this privilege of prayer. Father, we consider it a blessing of immense proportions that we're able to have this avenue that we can come before your throne. We're thankful for it, Father. At this time, Father, we would like to express our gratitude and appreciation for the opportunity that we have to meet here together at this time. We're thankful for the freedom and the peace and safety which we can meet in this building and encourage and be encouraged in your truths. Father, we're thankful for the Bible. We're thankful for the truth. We're thankful, Father, that we have the privilege of being able to learn it, to learn of you. And as we learn of you, Father, we learn of our dependency upon you, of our need for you, the guidance you have to offer for us. And Father, indeed, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And Father, we pray that we will always be mindful and seek to learn your truth, that we may rightly divide it, properly apply it to our lives. Father, may all the glory and honor and praise go to you for these things may be to the saving of souls. Father, we're thankful for the congregation that meets here and for the privilege that they have afforded us to be able to grow spiritually during this time. Father, we pray your blessings on them. Thankful, Father, for each person who is participating to help us grow, to encourage us. At this time especially, we're thankful for the three men on this forum. We're thankful, Father, for the efforts that they have made, not only recently, but throughout their lives, in preparation, learning of your word, that they may take on the task at hand and be able to enrich, enlighten, encourage in the truth of your word. Bless them, Father, as they seek to accomplish these things. Father, we're thankful for each individual who has worked so that this lectureship is a reality. Bless them in their labors, Father. And may the truth that goes forth from here, Father, be far-reaching. And may it go far and wide, and may it find those souls that are receptive. May they be saved through obedience to your will. Thankful, Father, for the blessings that are found in Christ Jesus. Thankful for the hope that's found through him and through his blood that was shed for us. Thankful for the church, Father. Thankful for those who remain steadfast and pure in holding to your truth. They're not ashamed of your name, nor of your church, nor of the gospel. The truth is found therein. Father, we pray that we'll always hold to that truth and never compromise. Help us to properly use it, Father, for the good of all mankind. Father, we pray for those who are enduring hardship now due to the weather. Maybe some who are on their way here, and Father, we pray for their safety. Father, we pray for your continued blessings throughout the days of this lecture as time may be permitted. Bless it to your name's honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first thing that I'd like to say is that it appears to me that Brother Broderick Greer would sure be a good prospect for the School of Preaching, Bob. So you might uh, keep an eye on him. Broderick, don't get away until you talk to Bob Stapleton over here. Uh, We have on the panel today Brother Darwin Hunter who is the chairman of the panel. Darwin preaches the the gospel down in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Does a wonderful work wherever he goes. Is a very very dedicated preacher of the gospel. And uh, many of us have known him for a number of years and love him very dearly and esteem him highly for his work's sake. And Darwin is going to uh, 
speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, Eddie says that I really can't put a limitation on him because he's heard him speak, and some preachers are prone to be long-winded. And uh, not but me. I'm not Darwin. No. no, Darwin's not that way. <laughs> but he's going to speak for about 10 or 12 minutes. He he did a manuscript on the subject of it is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Then Bob Stapleton, who is the director of the School of Preaching here, and Eddie Parrish, the pulpit preacher. And by the way, while I when I introduced Eddie uh, a while ago, I <clears throat> forgot to tell you that he's also the speaker on the Truth and Love Television program. And so uh, he has multiple responsibilities here. And anyway, they're going to discuss, have a little interchange with Darwin for just a few moments after Darwin presents 10 to 12 minutes uh, uh, introduction to the question or to the statement. After about five minutes or so of interchange, then we're going to open it up to uh, questions from the floor. And where are the young men that are, have the microphone? Stand up. There's one over here. There's the other back here. One's young and one's not so young. <laughs> but they, they have a panel, or, or rather microphones, and all you have to do if you want to ask a question is raise your hand so that one of those two men can see you. And they will bring the microphone to you. And what we would like for you to do is speak into the microphone. Don't stand way back where people can't hear you, but speak into the microphone, give us your name, and then ask your question. And if you want to direct it to one of the three, that's fine. Or if you just wanted to direct it to the whole panel, that's fine too. The choice is yours, but be thinking of a question. And uh, you might uh, write it down as you uh, listen to what's going on up here and then ask the question, because we'd like to have a stimulating discussion. With that said, Darwin, we turn it to you. Thank you, Brother Maxie. I appreciate very much uh, those kind words, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you uh, again this year in the lectureship. I uh, use, uh, try to use wisdom in accepting these invitations to do this. Last year, I leaned upon Brother Hardiman Nichols, who was chairman of the panel I was on, and this year, I thought uh, Russ and Phil were going to be here. If I'd have known it was be Eddie and Robert, I would have... Uh, maybe reserve judgment on that but uh, no these men will do fine I appreciate uh, their being here with me uh, we do want to make make it clear that we're not acting as any official voice of the churches of Christ I want everybody to understand that uh, that we approach this as a discussion forum on the scriptures and uh, our uh, basic premise and approach is uh, that uh, we come and reason together concerning the scriptures and we're not trying to legislate for the church the legislation has been done it's found in scripture and the headquarters is in heaven we have one king and to him we seek to submit so uh, we just wanted to make those things clear at the beginning in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23 is our text uh, for this uh, particular discussion uh, and you know we just had a lesson on lamentations in which uh, Jeremiah the prophet, who was given uh, the very hard task of speaking to Judah in its declining days, uh, in which destruction was looming, and uh, they had been forsaking God for many, many years. Jeremiah arrived on the scene and preached repeatedly and uh, with breaking heart over the condition of the people, sought to bring them back to God to cause them to leave their idolatries and their immoralities and all the other things they were doing uh, in forsaking God's will and way. And yet, of course, uh, they would not be turned. And so Babylonian captivity was soon coming. And when you read those words in Lamentations, it's, you would ask the question, why did this happen? How did it happen? Uh, and certainly Jeremiah 10 and verse 23 would give us a very good answer. Uh, if those burned and charred stones of Jerusalem's rubble could have cried out the reason, it is because of the fact that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. And when man begins to seek to direct himself and to believe that he's autonomous, that he's not governed by God and governed by his book, then we go astray. And we make multitudes of 
decisions which are wrong, that hurt ourselves, that hurt our families, that destroy our nation. And that's exactly what had happened uh, during his time. I want us to look at the uh, context a little bit of these words. Jeremiah chapters 10 and 11, we'll look at the context a little bit just to kind of set uh, the background. Uh, Jeremiah is talking about the idolatrous ways of Jerusalem, and that's their chief sin. And you find several things that he says here in chapter 10 as he begins to ridicule their chief folly, which is idolatry. He says in chapter 10 and verse 1, they are mimicking the ways of the Gentiles. They have not been taught what they're doing by God. They're not following his law. He didn't teach them idolatry. Uh, he taught them the worship of the one true God. But they're mimicking what they've learned from the pagan nations. They worship the creation of their own hands, he mentions in chapter 10 and verse number 3. They have devised their own gods out of the imaginations of their own hearts. And their gods are described as, as impotent beings which can do neither good nor ill. In other words, they are powerless. They have no breath in them, he says in chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 4 and 5, and then skipping down to verse number uh, 14. Their f false gods are going to perish from the earth when God uh, brings his judgment of wrath against this people. And uh, so uh, God makes it very clear, and Jeremiah does, as to what the problem is. We also find what the remedy is. The remedy is to appreciate who God really is. Uh, the true God is extolled in, uh, for example, in verse number 6. Uh, the true God is worthy of man's affection and praise. He is alive and He is all-powerful. He's not impotent like the creation of their hands, which have to be nailed into place lest they topple over. But He is the living and true God. He is the Creator God who brought forth and sustains His creation as he mentions in chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. But if you skip on down to chapter 11, God tells them what the remedy is. The problem is that they have forsaken his covenant, the law that he's given them to abide by. It. And he says in verse number 3, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. That's God's words to his people. He's trying to turn them back and call them back to his will. And then in verse 4 of 11, he said, chapter 11, he says, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you, so shall you be my people, and I will be your God. That's still what God wants, even in these days of uh, idolatry and immorality. It's what God wants today for his people to return. He wants our nation to turn back. He wants the church to turn back to the law of God, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, uh, we need to remember uh, the words in 23 that the way of man is not in himself. It is, it is so typical of us that I suppose probably before we even think about it, when we're asked some question or when uh, we are thinking about evaluating our own conduct, our own behavior in some certain matter, almost before we even think about it, we say, well, I think, I feel... I want, I desire, my opinion is, rather than saying, what saith the Scripture, which so often fell from the lips of Jesus, what does the Scripture say? How readest thou, he would ask those who uh, stood before him. And we need to do the same thing, to the law and to the testimony. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Find out what God says, and seek to diligently walk in that pathway. Uh, as I've said uh, because of the rapid change in our world and, and it comes at a dizzying pace. We sometimes uh, think that change is inevitable and because many of the changes that we observe, technological advancements and other things like that in our world are good for us and beneficial for us, therefore we begin to think that all change is good and beneficial. But of course, uh, when you're talking about out with the old and in with the new, which is a common slogan that we hear, that may be good about a worn-out car, but it's not good about God's law. It's not good concerning biblical revelation because that is unchangeable. Our God is unchangeable. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6. Uh, he does not cast a shadow by turning, James 1 verse 17. God is unchangeable. Therefore, His law 
is unyielding and unchangeable. And we have so many today who want to jettison Scripture and the pattern of Scripture regarding human conduct, uh, regarding morals, regarding uh, the doctrine of the Lord, regarding organization worship of the church, and any number of things. So these are the areas in which uh, I think some of our discussions uh, ought to go today. But we hear so often when people are evaluating even their own personal conduct, uh, they will say, well, I didn't feel like it was wrong because of what they did to me. In other words, they're evaluating their vengeful or vindictive spirit based upon their own feelings about it and how they were hurt or injured by someone else. Instead of being guided by the principles of Scripture, which tells us how to interact with others, how to love and be kind to others, how to even love our enemies, Matthew 5, verse 44. And so these are the kinds of things. We have, we have people today, for example, who will even justify abortion, as was mentioned in the last uh, lecture, uh, regarding uh, killing an innocent human life in the womb. And we hear these young mothers say things like, well, I felt like it would actually be more loving to take the life of that child because that child was unwanted and I didn't want that child to be raised in an un unloved situation. Well, isn't it possible to, to repent and to love the child that God has granted you? Of course it is, but repentance is out of the question. And so people are using these kind of pragmatic, utilitarian arguments to justify their actions rather than turning objectively to Scripture and saying there is objective truth and I ought to follow what God has said and bring my life into conformity to that. And we have the same thing in, in the church. As of the previous lecture, uh, the Richland Hills congregation here in Fort Worth has recently decided the, uh, in the alleged uh, collective wisdom of its eldership, and they said they all got together and they all agreed on it, that, uh, and had great unity in coming to this decision, that they're going to have services now on Saturday night for those who want to come on Saturday night, want their Sundays free, I suppose. And they're going to offer the Lord's Supper on Saturday night, which is, of course, contrary to the pattern of Scripture, uh, Acts 20 and verse 7, in which the early church partook of the supper on the first day of the week in commemoration of the Savior's death. And uh, they're going to offer instrumental music in their worship on Saturday night, contrary to Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, and all the New Testament passages regarding music in worship, which is vocal praise. But if you read what they say about it, it goes right to what we're talking about. Their argumentation is usually based upon pragmatism. Rick Ashley, their preacher, said that we've gone to this and we've decided this because we've decided, again in our vaunted human wisdom, that this is an obstacle to church growth when we only have vocal praise. And we believe that we can grow faster and we can uh, bring in more into our assemblies if we get rid of vocal praise. And instrumental music is appealing to people. And it is. We, won't, we don't deny that. But is it biblical? Is it according to the pattern that's been given to us? And again, we're full of pragmatism over the gospel of Christ. Thinking that we know better than God about how to direct the affairs of the church and how to worship. Worship is designed to glorify God. It's designed to bring Him the praise and glory that's due His name. Worship is toward God, John 4, 24. They that worship must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's not designed to simply appeal to the thought processes and imaginations of man. And so uh, the way of man is not in himself. Jeremiah said it long ago, and it needs to be repeated over and over in our own day and time. Go ahead. You want to say something? There are several things that could be elaborated upon, not because Darwin has not done a fine job because he has in introducing this but as we think about 
the issue today of the Word of God, we're faced with the, the situation of the fact that there is but one reason that God has given us the written Word, and that is so that we can know what His will is and then do it. And that is the foundation of it all. <clears throat> I was thinking whenever uh, he was pointing out about North Richland Hills, I want us to do a little exercise. He mentioned that the elders there had all agreed that it was right and proper for them to go ahead and exercise what it is they want to do. And this came from their human wisdom and the totality of their making this decision. I want us all to agree together tonight, to this afternoon, that this piece of paper is black. Now we're all agreeing that it's black. Shake your head. We're all agreeing that it's black. Is it? All of, if we filled this room from, from wall to wall where there would not be any space at all, and we all agreed that this was black, it would not change the fact it is not black. And no matter how many so-called elders of whatever congregation it might be, whether it's in North Lichen Hills or wherever it might be, who come together and uh, pontificate in relation to the idea of setting aside what the Bible has to say on this subject, good brethren, the Word still says what it has always said. And it will not change. I've made this offer. The offer is this. If North Richland Hills will be willing to take down their sign that says Church of Christ, I will close down the school of preaching that day and I will take the students down there to help take the sign down. Willingly do so. As Robert said so eloquently in his as he talked about that and so many other things, it is something to us. If we love the Lord, if we love the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, then brethren, it is something to us. And it's time we begin to show that it is something to us. And as we feel the tears well up in our hearts and in our eyes, let us move beyond that and take a stand the stand that God would have us to take. Stand upon the principles of God's word, knowing that it will be that, by that word that we will be judged on that day that is coming as sure as I'm sitting here and as sure as you are sitting there. So as we think of that, let us not be ashamed of the gospel. Let us never be fearful of the totality of the gospel. But let us stand firm together, linked together in the bond of love, as we preach the word, in season, out of season, when they like it, and when they don't. Just uh, one statement in, at the beginning <clears throat> about um, what was said regarding uh, uh, the motivation being to uh, increase growth. Um, reminded me of what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23 about verse 15 when he said um, you compass land and sea to make one proselyte I mean they were busy evidently but he said but when he's made he's twice the child of hell than yourselves uh, a lot of things can grow but if they're not growing according to God's assessment of what's proper, uh, then that growth doesn't need to be happening. Uh, now, to the general question at hand regarding um, the way of man not being in himself, anytime any person decides that they're going to try to be the guide for their own lives and to reject <clears throat> God's divine revelation, the root cause of that is pride. That's all it is. It's just old-fashioned pride that the scriptures say a lot about. Uh, goes before destruction, uh, book of Proverbs. Uh, it's one of the seven things God hates, right? Proverbs 6, a proud look. And so I also thought about how the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, I think, 
have much to say about that whole concept where Jesus starts out by mentioning how the blessed person is the one who first of all recognizes how poor in spirit he is. Uh, one who recognizes that without God he has nothing and is nothing. If a person can start out there, then you don't have to worry about pride because that's going to lead them then to mourn over that condition, the fact that they, they are sorry about their sins and uh, which leads to meekness of spirit, a teachable spirit, and hungering and thirsting and all that. It all goes together, but it starts with people being poor in spirit. And until we recapture that, we're still going to be fighting these battles over who's going to be the guide for our lives. If a person is truly poor in spirit and, is, and has um, uh, gotten rid of his pride, then this is not going to be an issue because we'll willingly and humbly bow ourselves before God and his word and let him call the shots. Uh, anytime we decide we're not going to do that, it's, it's just pride. That's all it is. All right. I think uh, that deals with our introductory matters. Does someone have a question that they would like to offer the panel? And we've already instructed many of the preachers in the audience to be kind in those questions. As you would have men do unto you, <laughs> do you even so unto them. Uh, my name is Ed Stover. Uh, Jeremiah was called by God to cry out to the nation of Judah about the problems they had. And he also called on Ezekiel to be a watchman and to call on those people that were in captivity. And my question is... With the problems that we're seeing of elders making decisions to direct their own steps in their own congregations, how as we are as individual Christians and as congregations, what is our responsibility to try to reach out to these people and these congregations? Oftentimes we speak of it in lectureships and we speak of the things that are <coughs> happening and we preach from the pulpit about things that are happening, but many times we don't hear of any efforts that are being made to confront these people. Uh, as Jeremiah confronted Judah and as Ezekiel preached to those in captivity. What should we do as individual Christians and as elders and as preachers and congregations to try to speak to these people to make a difference? All right, I, th I think that's a very good question and a valid one. Um, of course, I think you're right in speaking about uh, what's happening is because of a poor leadership. Uh, it is... Uh, a problem in, in the shepherding of the congregations it, when you have these uh, departures from the original pattern of New Testament Christianity. And, uh, you know, that's nothing new. Uh, Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34 both speak of the broken down shepherding that was characteristic of God's people in ancient days. Uh, with uh, Judah and Israel, they, they had shepherds that instead of binding up that which was broken, we're helping to break it. Instead of gathering the people, they were scattering the people from God and from His will. And we're, we have the same circumstance today. I mean, elders uh, have a weighty responsibility in watching for souls, Hebrews 13, 17. And we'll give an account for that watching of souls. And so uh, I think, you know, we have problem in shepherding. But when we shepherd local congregations and we have other congregations in the area that are going astray, uh, I think one thing that ought to be done is a loving challenge of those who are going astray to seek to talk to them about it. Uh, and maybe that's what you're talking about. Sometimes maybe that's not been done. Uh, I know in our uh, local area there in Shreveport, Bossier City, uh, there was a congregation of the Lord's people that had sent out a flyer um, to our congregation and I suppose to all the others in the area in which they were trying to uh, get people to come to, uh, get ladies to come to a ladies' day which they were hosting. And that particular ladies' day was one in which uh, uh, they mentioned that uh, a woman from a Baptist congregation was going to be speaking, or at least she was a member of a Baptist singles group in town. I later learned that she was actually a member of the congregation there, but she was also at the same time a member of the Baptist singles group in, in another uh, congregation, a Baptist congregation there in town. 
And then there was another lady who had been asked to sing on that particular program who was uh, from the Pentecostal church. And so when we got that flyer, well, I was not an elder at that time, uh, but I took it to the elders and I, I told them, I said, this is the kind of thing that's going on right here in our town with a sister congregation, which demonstrates that we don't understand biblical fellowship uh, if we're engaging in spiritual matters and spiritual fellowship with those who, who are not like-minded uh, in areas uh, pertaining to the church and to its worship, etc. And so um, our elders asked me to pen a letter, uh, which they would then send to that eldership, that congregation, asking them to, you know, get together and to discuss these matters. And so we did that. And we sent that letter forward, and of course they did not want to meet. I mean, and this is what you often get. I mean, you know, so I mean, some of these efforts have been made, but usually they don't want to meet. And uh, they did want to meet. He just wanted to explain some things, you know, and, and uh, well, the lady that was in charge of this took some liberties that we didn't know she was going to take. That's what this elder said that called back. And, uh, but since then, they've continued to do the same thing. So there was really no change of heart, but he wanted to kind of put a, a fresh coat of paint on it to make it look like they were not doing what they were doing. And, of course, uh, they continued to do the same kinds of things. They continued to embrace and have fellowship with uh, denominations in town and uh, in various Easter programs and, you know, Christmas programs and things of this nature. So uh, I think you're right. We ought to make the efforts... Uh, to strive to reach out to those who are digressives and are leaving the gospel of Christ. But we ought to recognize the fact that it's not always going to be accepted and that most of the time they'll stiff arm you and try to keep you from doing that. I obviously um, would agree with everything Darwin said, and, and I think sometimes... Um, maybe maybe that is the the first reaction that that we have sometimes because <clears throat> the first reaction being to um to talk about it amongst ourselves uh because you know because that's that's easier it's easier to talk about things like that with people that you know are in agreement with um with the biblical position uh it's a lot more difficult to step out there and try to begin that dialogue with those who are actually in error. Um, but those are the ones we need to get to, right? And those are the ones that need to be exposed to uh, the truth, not that, not that those folks haven't been exposed to it before. Uh, but, you know, you try. You try and offer them the opportunity. Um, it's like with what uh, was said to Ezekiel that was brought out in one of the earlier lectures. Um, you sound the warning, and you do what you can. And if uh, if it's heard and accepted, then uh, then that's wonderful. If it's not, then that person will suffer the consequences of his own sinful choices. But um, but the messenger himself, who did what he could, will will be absolved of responsibility. Is uh, is set in a position to watch and doesn't doesn't sound the warning when the opportunity affords itself then not only will the people who are in error suffer for their error but so will the messenger who should have spoken up and tried something but didn't um, and of course all of this is is obviously with respect for passages that indicate we need to do this with a with a gentle spirit and with humility uh, and I think that uh, in some instances in the past, um, I know of some personally in my own experience where uh, situations like this were, were addressed, but they were addressed so caustically and so abrasively uh, that, uh, that people couldn't get past the abrasiveness to actually see the truth that was actually trying to be presented. And we need to be careful about that. Under no circumstances should we compromise any truth under any circumstance, but we need to make sure that, that we um, are maintaining the spirit of Christ as we do it, 
but uh, I think most of the problem is not necessarily with that. It's just that we most of the time just don't do it. Uh, so uh, I agree with Darwin's uh, counsel there that uh, efforts need to be made. But uh, another thing that I would add to that as far as what responsibilities elders have uh, in situations like this and preachers and others goes back to some of the things Robert said in his previous lecture, and that is to make sure that where we are in our own home congregations are exposed to the truth regarding these issues so that um, things like are happening over there don't happen where we are. Um, some, sometimes preachers can do a lot of harm in congregations, not necessarily because they, it's not because they're, they're, they're teaching things that are abjectly erroneous, but because they fail to teach on important issues that brethren need to be exposed to, need to be aware of. And so some preachers fail in their responsibilities and elders as well um, by not making sure that, that brethren are uh, exposed to the truths that they need to be exposed to to fight against the innovations that are out there. We don't live in, in a bubble, you know. I mean, the things that happen in other places, people know about. They're exposed to it. They know about it. Then they come asking questions, and people are, are, are transient in their congregational affiliation sometimes, and you've got people coming in and placing membership from this place and that place. You've always got to be vigilant to make sure that those fundamentals are taught and uh, and taught regularly so that um, you can head off some of this before it reaches the point that it has in some of these congregations. As we give consideration to all of this and kind of start where Eddie left off and move backward, we understand we have a responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. That's not a suggestion, that's not a good idea, that is an obligation. And the preaching of the whole counsel of God means preaching just that, the whole counsel, when they want to hear it and when they don't, dealing with those matters that they uh, perhaps in a congregation do not want to hear, uh, matters dealing with such things as marriage, divorce, and remarriage, the moral issues of our present day, as Robert talked about this uh, earlier, uh, the idea of nudity uh, in our society and even in the church. We find ourselves in some congregations, brethren, uh, especially as Bible school teachers standing in front of young women, we have to look at the ceiling because we can't look down. And the reason for that is the dress of some of the young ladies that are in the congregation there, uh, and therefore we can't, I tell the guys in the school, establish eye contact. Well, that's hard to do sometimes. Uh, and we need to make some improvement there, so we need to have the intestinal fortitude enough to get up and preach the whole counsel of God. But Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, said, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. This is what Eddie was talking about, I think, the attitude that has to be there. We understand the responsibility to contend for the faith. I challenge you to look up the word contend and see if it anywhere suggests a contentiousness that is seen in some of our brethren today and some of the things that they say when they go on the warpath. We don't have to be contentious. We don't have to be mean-spirited. We may disagree. The three of us right here may disagree. But we don't have to go out of this room this afternoon disagreeable. We can love one another enough to sit down and try to work these things out based upon what the Bible has to say, upon what the Scriptures have to say. We talked about, and you mentioned the idea of elders. And uh, as we think of the writing of the book of Hebrews chapter 13, he says in verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Just because a man calls himself an elder doesn't necessarily make him one. We see that time after time after time today in congregation after congregation after congregation. The only thing worse in a congregation of not having an eldership is having an unqualified one. Men who have not filled the bill of the responsibility set forth within the scripture. We are reminded of what Paul, as he wrote to Titus, as he says in Titus chapter 1, in verse 9, holding the faithful word as has, as has been taught, that he might be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. A couple of years ago in the lectureship right here, I made the comment that I'm afraid that a lot of elderships I would not recognize a truckload of gainsayers if they pulled up in their parking lot. 
And it's because we don't know what the Bible says anymore. And that comes back to what we're talking about, preach the word. And uh, as individuals in a congregation, we have to understand the final person to determine my soul's salvation are not the elders of this congregation. They're not the elders of the congregation of which you might be a part of. That final determining person is me and is you. And when elders decide for whatever reason to lead us off some primrose path into liberalism or whatever it might be, then we must dare to be a Daniel. We must take a stand. And we fear not taking the stand on the truth. We do it with the right attitude. We do it with love. But we stand upon what the Bible teaches because we know it is that book which will judge us in the end. So as we think of these things, and they are happening. I was talking to an elder just the other day and he was telling me about a situation in the congregation where he is now an elder and I, I suppose he was not then, but he said uh, some years ago in that congregation there were a couple ladies that were quite vocal. And he said whenever uh, they didn't like the preacher, they just called up the preacher and said, you've got two weeks to move. Well, we've got all kinds of issues like that, but uh, somewhere along the line, gentlemen, as gospel preachers and as elders, We've got to have some good old guts to be able to stand up and preach it and, and teach it just the way God said it. Let me just add uh, to that. I appreciated uh, what Brother Robert said. But, uh, you know, I, th I think about this eldership, and, and we've mentioned this uh, already in another way, but, you know, the Bible tells us to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit mm -hmm. in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4 uh, verses 4 through 6. It's the unity of the spirit we're after. The spirit's teaching is truth. And it is all truth. John 16, 13. And it can't be improved upon by man. And, and if you have, again, a group of men. I don't care how large or how small who decide that God's way is not best and is not going to be practiced here, that doesn't mean that just because they're unified in that, it's the right thing to do. That's right. When we are unified in error, that is anarchy. That's right. When we're unified in error, that uh, is nothing more than mob rule. And the only thing that God approves and will bless is the unity of the Spirit. It's when we decide to be unified on the doctrine that's been taught us by the Lord. Take our stand firmly upon that. Build upon the solid foundation of His divine truth. And not on the shifting sands of man's thinking. Uh, as Jesus told us to do in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Build on the solid foundation so that when the storms come, it'll stand. And, and I'm afraid that sometimes we think that the goal is just being unified on something. No, the goal is being unified on truth. The Vatican is unified, but it's not on truth. I might add just uh, quickly, 1 John 1, 7 is very clear that fellowship between individuals is determined by those individuals' fellowship with God. That's right. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of His Son cleanses us from all sin. If, um, if a person has broken fellowship with God by rejecting God's will and rejecting God's uh, revealed uh, statutes in Scripture, uh, then uh, that, that breaks fellowship with all of those who are maintaining their loyalty to God. Fellowship with individuals is determined by each individual's fellowship with God. That's it. Hudson with the Birdville Church of Christ. I think it ought to be said that efforts have been made through the years for a number of years now uh, by the Burville Church, I know by this congregation, and by other congregations to reach out to the Richland Hills Church of Christ, uh, to sit down with them and talk with them. And uh, we have just simply not been successful. Uh, and that offer still stands. We would love to sit down and talk with the preachers or the elders or anybody else who would like to discuss the issue because we're only concerned about doing what's right. And we love those brethren, uh, just like we love uh, our own congregations. 
And so I hope that they know that. And uh, recently I put in a call to at least one of the ministers there uh, expressing my concern, but still have not heard anybody return that call. Uh, I think that we need to realize that not only do we need to reach out to these churches, but it's our responsibility to inform and to warn uh, the whole body of Christ about these things. Paul, how many times did he say it? I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Mm. He wanted them to know what was going on, and he warned people about uh, false teachers, calling them by name, and even pointed out churches that were in trouble. And, uh, of course, our Lord did the same thing in the Revelation. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we do this uh, because of a concern and love for the body of Christ. At the Burwell Congregation, we're going to be uh, speaking to Rick Ashley's sermons uh, where he made an attempt to justify biblically their changes in the worship. And we'll be speaking to that each Sunday morning in the month of February. We had a preacher's much meeting recently, and I encouraged all the preachers to do similar things in their congregations. Church, the preachers have got together and we're working on putting out a full-page ad in Fort Worth Star Telegram concerning this very thing of a cappella worship and uh, showing our unity uh, in that regard. So there are some efforts that are being made. I'm sure other efforts could be made, but uh, <clears throat> we're not just talking about it. We're, we're really concerned and wanting to do uh, what the Lord would have us to do in this matter. So be praying about it and be encouraging your elders, your preachers, your congregation, uh, wherever you worship, to uh, do what we can, uh, not only in, in regards to uh, the Richland Hills Church of Christ, but to uh, false teaching around the brotherhood. It's been said that there's none so blind as those who will not see, and we can make the same implication as there are none so deaf as those who will not hear. And the tragedy of all of this is that as we look at situations like this, and probably every one of us in here would be more than happy to spend uh, whatever time it would take to try to help our brethren, wherever they might be, get back on track. Nevertheless, we realize that there are some who are just simply not content to get back on the track. And that is uh, a, a discouraging factor, uh, and yet we know that Jesus had to. Robert mentioned in his sermon about how that Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept over that great city because he saw what had happened. And as we look at the church today, no doubt we weep at some of the things that are happening, and we would reach out, and uh, I think we all commend Birdville and other congregations that are doing those things. Amen. Amen. Uh, one passage <clears throat> that... Um, that came to mind that uh, are the panelists allowed to actually ask questions of the other panelists? That might be something interesting. <laughs> um, but uh, you might recall in Matthew 15 after Jesus had uh, uh, denounced the uh, Pharisees for their vain worship, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men, and the disciples came to him afterward and said, Lord, did you realize that you offended the Pharisees when you said that. And his response, Matthew 15, verse 14, was, Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind, and when the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. Um, you wonder sometimes at what point do you, do you reach the point where, where that becomes the, the proper action uh, to... To, to just simply sever all ties and, and, and leave them alone. I, that's, that's my question, not really a, a statement really, but at what point do, do we get to there? Darwin. <laughs> I thought we were going to make this easy. Uh, well, obviously there is a time in which we've made every effort that we know we can make that we think is going to be fruitful. And then, as the Lord said, we shake the dust off and move on. And I think sometimes uh, we should spend the proper amount of time, you know, I know that we're talking about human judgment here, uh, in which we're trying to retrieve and trying to repair and trying to cause brethren to return. But uh, I've been involved in situations, you have too, I'm sure, in which you've made those efforts, they have been rebuffed, and you feel like it's not 
worth the effort anymore. And maybe I ought to go to someone who is uh, more receptive to the gospel. And so uh, I think there comes a time in which you have to do that. You know, the Lord even said through Hosea the prophet in Hosea chapter 4, Ephraim is joined unto her idols. Let them alone. There comes a time when that has to be done. And uh, again, we are talking about human judgment there, but uh, uh, I believe you've made a valid point that, that that sometimes is required. I suppose we all understand, although we may not be able to completely understand it, we appreciate the long sufferingness of God, the patience that's there. I, th I thought of one word, and I thought, no, there's no way I can just say one word and shut up, but <laughs> the word soul. There are souls at stake. And yes, I agree 100%. There comes a point in time, and yes, it does come down to human wisdom. Would to God he had given us. When we start talking about 70 times 7 and all of those things, we well realize there's a lot of ambivalence there. There's a lot of uncertainty there. How far do we go? When, ha when are we casting our pearls before the swine? When do we need to shake the dust off? Uh, no doubt we all would understand we need perhaps at least the wisdom of a Solomon, if not more, to figure out the answer to that. But prayer and patience and love for our erring brethren would cause us perhaps to go maybe even just a tad further. <clears throat> it's kind of like the Roman soldier when he said, here, you carry my burden for a mile. And Jesus said, no, you take it too. So... Perhaps we don't give up completely until, well, we just don't exist anymore. Through prayer, persistence. I'm glad somebody didn't give up on me. Hmm. And I'm, I'm not in any way trying to say anything contrary to what these gentlemen have said. We're all saying the same thing, just a little bit differently. But we want to be patient in this and we want to continue to extend efforts to brethren who have, uh, whether they've slipped off into the recesses of liberalism or if they've dove off head first, whatever the case, they're still there, aren't they? And we, and we want to try to snatch them out of the fires of hell if it can be possibly done. John McFarland here, formerly known as the preacher man. Nearly all my friends know me that way. And there's a reason for that. I worked 30 years at General Motors, and my, while my time there, I preached to anybody that would listen to me from the plant manager on down, publicly, privately. I run in debate the biggest part of my time there with all the denominations that were there, preaching to them publicly in their, the errors of their ways and on the, on the subject of instrumental music and many other subjects, the Holy Spirit and all. Well, they call me about everything. And I'd have to tell them, no, I can't, you can't call me that way. That, I can't wear that handle. That belongs to God. And finally, they came up with the preacher man. I said, I reckon I can handle that. I've seen so much error taught in, in the ways of the world and also in the church. And, and in regard to Richard Hills, that didn't, that's not the first departure that they've made. That's just, that's just an outcome of many other departures that came along. Uh, I had a real problem with their, with their ladies getting up and directing the singing and getting their quartets and their, and, and their courses together and, and, a, and a lady directing it with men and women in the, in the courses. As a matter of fact, I came up on that one time and a good friend of mine was singing bass in, in the quartet or in the course. And when they concluded, I went to him and I said, brother, I'm gonna tell you something. I do not think that woman is scriptural. By doing that, I think she's far out of line and I said, I think your elders need to know that. Now, brother, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you this opportunity. You talk to the elders and you, you relate what I'm saying to you, or I'll talk to them. The subject needs to be covered. Well, I don't reckon I've seen or heard any more of their groups with, it, with the ladies. But, uh, brother, this not only in that church, but many other congregations around the country is doing the same thing with the women. The women are out of line. They're taking, <clears throat> they're taking far more liberty in the church than they need to take. And I'll tell you this, if you stand back far enough, they'll take over. They'll step right in there. An illustration of that would be a, a one of the farmer congregations I used to lead singing for. A rather large congregation, one that you know, but I won't call the name of it. As a song director, I'm working with them, and uh, there was a funeral service. 
So one of the elders called upon one of the good sisters to select a, a group of people to, to sing for that, for that funeral. She did. She selected, she selected several people. I came in the congregation early to practice up for the singing, and I noticed that she was standing out in front of the audience. I said, lady, if you will, you can sit down over there. I'll take over. And, oh, no. No, no. I, I, I'm the one that's directing this. Now, you're going to sing bass, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead this. <laughs> well, I said, I, 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 I really got a problem with that. Well, I said, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be kind, but I'm not, I'm not dropping this issue just now. And as soon as that service is over, I went to the elders and I said, Brother, I want to tell you something. I don't know which one of you selected that lady to take care of this singing this, in this funeral service. But I want to tell you this right now. If you don't stop that, if that ever happens again, I'll no longer be a member of this congregation. I'll be leaving. As far as the, as far as this, the instruments and singing goes, of course, being a song leader most of my life as well as a preacher. Uh, brother, I don't know how many of you have got pianos at home. How many of you have got guitars and different instruments at home and, and away from the congregation, away from the worship, you're sitting there banging on that piano and singing gospel songs? I take a stand on that. I believe if, I believe if it's wrong in the congregation of worship, it's wrong at home, it's wrong for anywhere to use instrumental music and sing in praise to God. I make a stand on that. And, and this, is, this is something that I'm, I'm really much concerned about. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of good gospel tracks. You can find them in every rack just about that deal with the subject of instrumental music, that deal with the subject of the Lord's Supper. Maybe these brethren have forgotten. Maybe they need to be reminded. Maybe we need to take those tracks and distribute them among the members. <laughs> hey, this is it, brother. This is what the Bible, this is the truth. Here's a sermon on the subject. Now you take that sermon and you, you read it, you deal with it, and I believe that might have a big bearing on the uh, issues that are at hand. Thank you, brother. Well, I appreciate those comments, and I uh, don't know that there was a, a question necessarily in that, but uh, uh, I appreciate what you said, and I think the stance that you've made is, is biblical in those, in those areas, and I take the same stance. I really believe that we have injured ourselves considerably uh, by sometimes saying we're going to allow at home what we don't allow in worship, you know, in the assembly bracketed by the opening prayer and the closing prayer <laughs> and I believe wherever we're worshiping God we ought to follow his rules Amen. whether it be at home or at camp or uh, whatever we're doing we ought to follow those rules that pattern is in place and uh, I don't believe it's limited just to our church buildings and uh, I've often asked the question of those who want to say we can uh, sing Amazing Grace with the piano at home just not in a worship assembly at 10.30 on Sunday morning, uh, I've often asked them, well, can you pray through Mary at home? And they lo always look at you kind of stunned, you know, but, I mean, if there is a pattern of worship, then it doesn't change. Our prayer should be offered to God uh, scripturally, whether at home or uh, in the worship assembly. And I think the same thing would be true with praise to God. And so I appreciate your stance in that regard and would uh, commend it. Amen. James Gravel from Ardmore. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, one of God's leaders, Saul, who was made king, was given orders to carry out. And in the process of doing so, he decided to change those orders just a little bit. And as he came marching back to town with captives, he was given instruction by Samuel. Would God's words through Samuel there apply in our current discussion to the congregations like Richland Hills or others who just decide to change God's will? The principle, would, uh, so far as I could ascertain, would be the same in so far as whenever we see that God has legislated don't we even start with Genesis 3 with that problem that here God has spoken to Adam and Eve and was very specific about what they were not to do in so far as the fruit of the tree of knowledge and yet what did they do they modified it to what some would think was just a small bit but look what happened to them you see that's the real danger that I think a lot of our brethren don't understand and that is is that 
Anytime the word of God is perverted, Paul dealt with that in Galatians chapter 1, didn't he? That they had taken the gospel and had perverted it. Let me ask you this much. How much poison in a can of Coca-Cola would cause you to say you don't want that can of Coca-Cola? Well, if you got any sense at all, uh, it wouldn't be a whole lot. Well, any time, no matter what it is, and we can look at numerous instances, Nadab and Abihu, they may have re uh, reconciled in their thinking, well, this is not all that bad. It's just a little thing. But there is no such thing as a little thing when it comes to the changing and the perverting of God's word. So any scenario where we see that God has said, do this, and we say, well, it's, that doesn't get it. To obey is better than sacrifice. That's what... Samuel said, and it's not just a lot of sacrifices God wanted. He wanted humble, obedient hearts to offer him the sacrifices that he devised. And so it, it's not just worship God wants of any kind, and we fill in the blank. It's the worship he devised for our good and for his glory. And, uh, uh, you know, just he mentioned Genesis 3 just as... As uh, Satan said on that occasion, we have many who are doing his bidding today. Has God said? That's what he asked. Has God said? And he began to try to undermine her faith in what God had said. And uh, that's what we have many doing who are standing in our pulpits today. They're trying to undermine and tear away at the foundation of people's uh, faith in what God has really said. We need to get back to what God has said and speak as the oracles of God. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> what happened with um, the, the animals that were kept back for sacrifice there in 1 Samuel 15 against God's direction is similar to, um, in some ways, to what happened in Exodus, I believe it's chapter 32, with the golden calf incident. And as those incidents are similar to a lot of what's going on in some of our congregations today, and I just call all of that, 1 Samuel 15, Exodus 32, and a lot of what's going on today is the seeker-friendly approach to worship. I hear that terminology so much that it, you know, it's sickening. We have turned worship, and Darwin talked about this earlier in his remarks, we've turned worship into seeker-friendly services. Well, that's what the people wanted. Remember, Saul said, but the people wanted the animals, and so we kept them. And the people wanted the calf, so we did that. Well, the people today want instrumental music and gymnastics for Jesus and whatever else people can come up with. That's what the people want, and so that's what a lot of congregations are doing. And um, we need to be concerned about whether or not our, our worship is God-friendly. Forget seeker-friendly. Uh, we're gathering to worship God, and if seekers, whoever they are, if they don't care for that, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not what this is about. If our worship is not attractive to the masses, I can't help that. I want my worship to be attractive to God, Amen. and so should everybody. Amen. There are three types of worship mentioned in the Bible, as we're well aware of. Uh, some have already been alluded to. Of course, there is true worship, John 4. There's also vain worship, Matthew 15. And then there is will worship, worship that is designed to appease and to comply with my will, my desire, what I want. And as has been so eloquently said here by these gentlemen, the fact is, is that we ought to seek to please God. I've often thought about this. I think about the old sacrifices under the old covenant. And those burning sacrifices came up as a sweet smelling odor to God. Have you ever smelt, I'm not talking about cooking a hamburger or a steak, I'm talking about flesh in that kind of a capacity burning. It's not sweet. And if you've ever heard me sing, it isn't sweet. Amen. Amen. But, thank you very much. Um, but the bottom line is, is that to God it is. I'm making, and I'm glad I can make a joyful noise. And it really is more noise than anything else, but he likes it because I'm doing what he said. Man, that's and right. that's all that it is, is what he said. That's all that counts. Our time is up. This was a very stimulating discussion and excellent comments by all three of our panelists. And we want to thank them, Bob Stapleton, Darwin Hunter, and, 
and Eddie Parrish for their excellent insight into God's Word, for their strong stand for truth. Uh, at 4.30, which is just two or three minutes from now, will be the uh, School of Preaching uh, dinner. And uh, Brother Bob Stapleton, of course, will be in charge of that. And we would like to urge all of you to go to that. We sometimes call it the Preacher School Alumni Dinner, but we don't have that many of the alumni from the School of Preaching here tonight. So we need all of you to come. And uh, I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. The meal will be $4 per person, uh, just as it was uh, at noon today. And there will be plenty of food. There will be good fellowship. And we'll learn a little bit more about the School of Preaching. And I, I know that Bob's going to want to tell you about the uh, Spanish uh, program that we have going here and, and perhaps answer any questions you might have. So let's all plan to leave uh, the auditorium and get in line right away and go to the School of Preaching dinner at start.